Next up, we have Dr. Ari Cedars talking about uh, Epstein's anomaly, or if I want to sound smart, maybe Epstein's anomaly. Um, Ari's already been uh, introduced once, so I'm going to cut it short, but adult congenital heart disease, Baylor and Dallas. All right. Well, let's try and get this show moving here. I don't know if I can clip myself. All right, so I'll be talking about Epstein's anomaly. Um, and uh, I have, the only disclosure I have to make about Epstein's anomaly is I absolutely loathe Epstein's anomaly. Um, I was talking with Andrew Crean, I don't know if any of you know who that is, he's an MRI guy from Toronto, and he asked me what lesion I loathe more than any when I know that they're going to be seen in my clinic, and it's a patient with Epstein's anomaly. And it's mainly because I have no idea what to do with them, and so I'll hopefully share with you why that might be. Um, so we'll talk about epidemiology of Epstein's anomaly, the anatomy and associated abnormalities, physiology, and then repair. So this is another one that's about as common as hen's teeth, just like, uh, probably not as uncommon as a complete Schoen's complex, but uh, nevertheless, not something you're going to see every day. Um, it is associated in certain pedigrees with certain chromosomal or genetic abnormalities, um, even uh, myosin heavy change 7 genetic defects, um, but the majority of cases are sporadic. Um, previously described association with lithium toxicity or maternal lithium use has been largely debunked with this Danish group that came up with that in like the 1970s. Turns out it's probably some kind of a biased sample. Sexes are e equally affected. All right. This is the single worst example of Epstein's anomaly you will ever see. I, I use it only because you, it allows you to appreciate that the little nubbin of an RV that is left when you have displacement of the AV valve towards the, or the, the right side of the AV valve, tricuspid valve towards the apex of the heart is what causes a lot of problems. But in reality, Epstein's anomaly means that the leaflets of the tricuspid valve, which normally unstick themselves from the interior of the vent uh, right ventricular wall sometime during embryogenesis, that whole process fails to occur for the septal leaflet almost completely. In really bad cases, it also affects the posterior leaflet. The anterior leaflet it actually is normally long and redundant, so it kind of makes up the difference for the other valve. So you have some limited zone of coaptation kind of displaced far towards the apex of the heart. And as a result, there's a portion of the ventricular myocardium which comes, becomes functionally a part of the atrium. And this ventricular myocardium, that is atrialized ventricular myocardium, is not normal. It doesn't contract well. The RV conduction apparatus runs right through here, it, the, and, it, and it's all screwed up. It doesn't work normally. And so this is what leads to a lot of the problems later on with, with Epstein's anomaly. Um, in terms of diagnosis, uh, it's fairly obvious when you get an echocardiogram, you have a, a, um, a tricuspid valve annulus, which um, is greater than one centimeter apically displaced relative to the mitral valve. It should be normally less than that, a little more apical than the mitral, but not quite that far. Um, ECG, usually you will see the so-called Himalayan P waves, which is as a result of these giant right atrium, which gets even more giant as a result of the torrential tricuspid regurgitation that this lesion causes. Um, and you see a right bundle branch block morphology. What is not shown on this is evidence of an accessory pathway or pre-excitation, which is far more common in patients with Epstein's anomaly than in the general population. Epstein's patients can have just absolutely massive cardiac silhouettes on chest x-ray. Some of the biggest cardiac silhouettes I've seen are Epstein's patients, and it's all right atrium, all right atrium. Associated abnormalities, they very commonly have an, an interatrial communication. ASD, probably more commonly they have PFO, but it's particularly relevant in patients with Epstein's anomaly because due to the tricuspid valve abnormality, they inevitably will have increased right atrial pressures and they'll be shunting from right to left and therefore become cyanotic. 25% of cases will have an accessory pathway and ventricular pre-excitation. This is particularly nefarious in somebody who's got a big stretched out electrically remodeled right atrium predisposed to atrial arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation. If you have a robust accessory pathway, you can be pounding the ventricle very frequently with high uh, frequency impulses and lead to ventricular fibrillation. Um, approximately 40% will have associated left heart disease, 
the most common things being mitral valve prolapse or left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy, in particular if there's a genetic association with, with myosin heavy gene 7. And then LTGA patients, for reasons that I'm not 100% sure I, I fully understand, having to do with the, whatever genetics underlie congenitally corrected transposition, they seem to have a high prevalence of, of abstinization of the systemic AV valve. So when do we repair patients who have Epstein's anomaly. Obviously, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the presentation. Some people have really apically displaced valves, and some people's valves are really not that apically displaced. And obviously, the more displaced the valve is, the more it leaks, the more likely somebody is to come to clinical attention as a result of problems they're having. Um, so what's the threshold that we use? Um, obviously, the people that have gotten to us as adult physicians um, have kind of passed the test of life. They're not people who have such a little small sliver of a right ventricle that it can't accommodate normal blood flow and they require some kind of a hemifontan or something. They've gotten to us because they've kind of already passed that test. And so the criteria according to the 2008 guidelines that we use are if they have evidence of right ventricular failure, they're having um, either, either uh, uh, the right ventricle contractility is declining, they're having progressive enlargement of the cardiac silhouette or of the right-sided chambers on chest x-ray or echo, that would be an indication. In patients who have an atrial septal defect or a patent foramen ovale and who are having problems with cyanosis is causing symptoms, that would be an indication. Or in patients who you think they're just having heart failure symptoms, they can't do what they used to be able to do and it's attributable to this right-sided lesion, those people you should be doing surgery on. Now, this is why I hate Epstein's anomaly. I'm not so sure that the surgery actually makes people feel any better, and I can't predict who it's gonna make feel better and who it's not gonna make feel better. So, you know, the nightmare scenario is somebody comes in, they say, oh yeah, I feel bad. You do an echo, you find Epstein's anomaly. So then what do you do? Somebody's like 40 years old. Obviously, they've done okay for 40 years. So, and, or even worse, somebody who's doing fine, and you discover they have Epstein's anomaly and severe TR, and they say, I feel fine. Are you going to prevent anything by doing surgery on that patient? And, and the answer is I, I, I actually don't know the answer. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. So I've alluded to the fact that there's a conduction abnormality. So we're going we're gonna to do a human demonstration here. Okay, so like my arms are like the upper part of the right ventricle. My legs are like the lower part of the right ventricle. So we know that patients with Epstein's anomaly, I told you they have this right bundle branch conduction abnormality because that, that atrialized portion of the septal leaflet is screwed up the myocardium there. And so their right ventricle contracts kind of like this. <laughs> right, so it starts like this, one side contracts, and then that relaxes when the other side contracts, and then that goes back out again, right? <laughs> now, in addition to that, I told you that the atrialized portion of the ventricular myocardium, it doesn't work well, it doesn't contract well. So say you move the annulus back to where it's supposed to be, and now that atrialized portion is integrated into the ventricle. So the apex is here, and my arms, they're up towards where the valve is. So now you get like, like dyslexic jumping jacks, right? It kind of goes. So right, when the apex contracts, all that contractile force just fills the proximal portion of the chamber, which then just discharges itself back into the apical portion of the chamber during diastole. So you end up losing a fair portion of the contractile force. Now, don't even ask me to do both of those things together. Uh, I'm not that coordinated. But you can imagine that it's a very inefficient. So are you actually doing any good? And you know, because you're relieving tricuspid valve regurgitation, there is some evidence that you probably are doing some good. And this is data from the Great Ormond Street Hospital in Great Britain where it shows it's an MRI study. They looked at patients who had had tricuspid valve repair specifically. Repair has been demonstrated to be better than replacement, particularly since Dr. Silva developed the cone technique for repair, which is actually very good. Um, people have to have a posterior leaflet if you're going to do it. But if you can do it, it's a good thing to do. And it shows that um, they develop, after repair, you have a modest increase in stroke volume, and you probably have a modest increase in your VO2 max, nothing dramatic, but really what's more important to patients is they feel better. Their fu functional class improves, and I think that alone is a justification for doing it, and that also speaks to the fact that we probably shouldn't be doing this kind of a repair in somebody who's asymptomatic, because the, the improvements in VO2 max or in, in, in uh, forward flow are, are fairly modest. 
Um, now, not everybody is a candidate for repair. Only certain people are going to have a posterior leaflet that's not stuck down and that can be used in a cone repair. And for those who need a replacement, it turns out that um, bioprosthetic valves are better than mechanical valves. This has been studied. This is from the Mayo Clinic. They actually looked at mechanical versus bioprosthetic valves. The stability of the valve, or the, rather the longevity of the valve, is relatively equivalent between the two. However, the mortality rate was higher in people who had a mechanical valve. They had more problems with valve thrombosis. Um, they got infections on the valve. They just had a whole lot more problems. And so putting a bioprosthetic valve with all of its fleas and ticks, the fact that it's going to deteriorate in its function over time is actually the way to go in patients who have um, uh, Epstein's anomaly. Finally, atrial arrhythmias. If they have a, uh, an accessory pathway, you burn out the accessory pathway if it's causing time, if it's causing problems, or it, they should go at, at a minimum to have an EP study and make sure that the accessory pathway isn't robust. And by robust, I mean that it doesn't uh, fail to block uh, when you stimulate the atria rapidly. So, which would put them at risk for having ventricular fibrillation should they go into atrial fibrillation, which we know they're predisposed to having. Now, if they develop atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, how successful is ablation, catheter-based ablation? Not so great. So you have like around 50% recurrence here. This is, a, this is a series from the Mayo Clinic. 50% recurrence of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter after catheter-based ablation. What does this tell us? If you're sending somebody to surgery, let the surgeon do a maze because it's going to be more effective than catheter-based ablation in patients who are having atrial arrhythmias. And atrial arrhythmias can be a substantial contributor to their overall symptomatology. All right, so to conclude, Epstein's anomaly is a defect in the tricuspid valve. I don't really know when it's good to send patients for surgery or not, probably when they're symptomatic. Um, the predominant abnormalities they have are signs of right-sided heart failure. So if somebody comes in, they have signs of right-sided heart failure, they're symptomatic, that's an indication for surgery. Catheter-based ablation of atrial arrhythmias is probably, I mean, you can try it, probably it's not going to last forever. Um, but uh, and, um, the ablation of uh, accessory pathways, if present, can be frequently successful. And what about if they're pregnant and they're asymptomatic? And sorry, or if they want to become pregnant and they're asymptomatic? So that's an excellent <laughs> question that I don't know the answer to. I mean, I mean probably if I were going to do that, I would. I would probably. I would probably if somebody either is thinking of becoming pregnant, I honestly would send them for an exercise test, see how they do, and if they do okay on an exercise test, say you're probably fine to get pregnant. Um, and it, because they've kind of passed the test of, of the capacity to augment cardiac output as needed. If they have a substantial limitation, then you, know, you can't, uh, then, then I would say maybe you, know, you could consider fixing the valve, but again, with the caveat that you may not actually augment their capacity to augment cardiac output by fixing the valve. Somebody who's already pregnant, I mean, that's like nothing. You, you can kind of just watch them carefully and give them diuretic when they need it, but uh, uh, the horse has left the barn in that situation. <laughs>